Welcome to Services Marketing and Chapter 7, in which we will start talking about capacity and demand, which really is the extension of price and distribution, and now putting those two into an applied setting. So we'll sit inside uh, multiple parts of the marketing mix. Productive capacity has a particular uh, element to it where you're dealing with consumer behavior, the whole of the marketing mix. So it's a real integrated bring the ideas together. And you'll find this as we're rolling through the remaining chapters now. It's, it's gone from being this sort of silo of here's an idea on its own to here's the overlap and interplay between the, the concepts and the frameworks. Now, when we think about productive capacity in services, we've got multiple areas we need to be considering. So obviously if we are running a physical location-based service, and hence you can start seeing distribution in here already, was the productive capacity, it's the venue, it's the physical facilities. It's the areas that are designed to store, store contain and process customers. It's the areas designed to store, contain and process physical objects. So the flower of service is starting to link in here. The hospitality versus the security. Productive capacity are, also covers the people. It's the labor. It's the infrastructure. And it's the money. Now, facilities, equipment, labor, infrastructure, and money are also, in part of that, you're going to have wrapped up in their technology. So if you've got a website, the website would sit under, and the website's role is to provide the service, it's the facility. If the website's role is to be the transaction, the point of transaction, it's the infrastructure. If the website requires staff members on the other end talking to people, interacting with people, it's labor. So you've got to look at this from the point of view of however the service is delivered, it's usually the background, the elements, the people, and I bring the finances in here for if you've got money tied up that you're not getting return on. So you're renting a facility that you're not using, or you're hiring staff that aren't getting to work, or you're buying up resources that are perishing, you're not getting productive capacity out of your money. So in capacity management, we're looking at a couple of tasks. And one of these tasks is, in, it's a very short theoretical concept. It's a really difficult practice. And that is, how do we change capacity? We have two directions we want to change capacity. We want to shrink capacity levels because we have excess and so we want to store. And we want to stretch capacity. We want to have the ability to, in peak demand, improve the number of people we can bring in. Now, if you stop and think about something where, like a restaurant. Now, if a restaurant has a standard table seating, so it can take 64 customers in a sitting, unless it was to set, and those are distributed as 32 two-seater tables. Link them together, and you've still got the same number, but you start, as you build these longer tables, these small compacted tables, you suddenly realize that your actual floor space can get you up to, from 64 to, say, 78, 80. You've got an outside area, throw a few tables out there when it's really busy and you know, decent conditions, suddenly you're at 100. You can stretch your capacity by placing tables into, by reducing the overall space between tables, adding tables in. So you can make the capacity vary. Alternatively, what you could do is that you could know that on a Monday night, it's slow service night, so you don't get all the tables out. You know, it's a big night on Saturday, very high traffic. On Sunday, you basically start putting the tables away so that on Monday night, it's, there's more room. So it's your 
tailoring for privacy on the Monday, capacity on the Saturday. Your other approaches are to have things like the multifunction spaces where multiple things can take, you can do different things with the spaces. You can modify your opening hours to track demand and find demand. And you can also look at how quickly can you throughput and process people. Now time and service space is going to link up to ServiceScape and it's going to link up to some of the other fac factors here in terms of what is the time price for consuming the service. Now in a peak period you could just make a set of services unavailable. You know that in high demand it's going to be 45 minute turnover. That's what you need. So what you do is you reduce the palette of service products that are available in peak demand. You only have the express services so you can throughput in a 90 minute period two customer blocks as opposed to in a slow demand period you can open up the 90 minute service offering because you know you've got time. So again you want to look here very carefully at combining your knowledge of price, of distribution and of product but also you want to be looking at the audiences. What are the audiences going to want in our, and what different types of capacity demand will exist by different audience. And we'll get to that in a moment. So the other things that you want to look at here in terms of variations on demand, and the text does a good set of detail here, variations by customization. Now the more customized uh, product is, the slower it is because you can't be using your routine training. And in fact, customization is a great way to find out just how good your backstage at a service is. And a personal case example of this was a restaurant, a very high end top of town restaurant in capital city. It's down in the uh, location is perfect. It's down at one of the expensive ends of town. It's near where there's stockbrokers and lawyers and very expensive taste people. A customization to a dietary customization, dietary requirement customization for an entree took them eight attempts to get right because they were so used to a formulaic high speed production of this particular food that they were unable to customize it without breaking because they kept that they weren't thinking, they weren't consciously creating the product. So the variation slowed them down. A, because they kept making mistakes, and B, because they were used to not customizing. Customization was slower, they were peak speed people. The next aspect to the variations that happen is the capability and capacity of the customer to co produce. Now, if you've ever been to a gym, you know that there are customers who know their role, they know what to do, and they know how to share gym equipment, how to work out together. And there are customers who don't, either by uh, lack of socialization or simply that they don't intend to share nicely. So depending on what the customer and the customer's willingness to co-create, particularly in crowded environments, to work with each other rather than against each other, to collaborate. And we see this where we've got high queuing and peak demand behaviors where, say, going to the airport, coming, you know, coming from the airport at a high peak time, customers self-select to say, look, I'm headed to this location, does anyone want to come with me? We also have effort variation that will determine um, some of your demands, your patterns, your movements. How much effort is the customer wanting to put in? How much effort does the customer need to put in? And you all know that the cultural protocol is look at the menu on the way to the counter so that when you get to the counter, you make the order, right? Well, if you need to make the modifications, and you've got to confirm the modifications, and you've got to work with the counter staff, effort variation, request variation, capability variation. Do you know this role that you're supposed to make your decision before you arrive to the point of purchase? Do you know what the decisions are you can make? Do you need to request additional information? Do you want to talk to the server to confirm 
uh, again, get additional information or check if customization is possible. If customization is possible, then make those customization decisions. All of these things change the way the pattern works in the service delivery, hence why inconsistency and variability are features of services. And that will change how the demand and how people can, and throughput and also how the capacity can work. So let's briefly talk about a couple of things about adjusting capacity. This is adjusting down and adjusting up. So one of the things that we can look at is rotating the downtime. And this is something I, with hairdressers, because I was prone to uh, finding the downtime on my hairdressers to go and use their cheaper prices, but also deal with less people, is the downtime at the hairdressing salon was used for skill development and training. So the hairdresser wasn't actually working on a client. They would be practicing training and developing new product offerings, new colorings, new color schemes. So they're effectively on availability for walk-in, but they're in training mode. So you're actually getting them to, your staff are doing different functions. Your other options in this include things like cross-training so that your staff can perform multiple roles so that you're in a high capacity. And again, we see this with uh, where there's a peak demand. You have staff who aren't usually counter staff being able to step up and deliver the service and go back to their other roles when the demand drops. If you know you've got scheduled demand, part-time and seasonal employees, building in more self-service options, more co-production options so that the customer can take a greater role in their own service creation. And that role, if the demand can actually ease some of the demand and make greater use of the capacity. It also gives the option to on, say, slower days. You go to a, a, a service which has customization capacity on a slow day, they might ask you if you want to change things up, if you want to try something new. Quite often, uh, if you got used to attending a restaurant in an off-peak period, they would come and talk to you as a co-producer, knowing that you had, some, uh, checking if you had some time, because they certainly had time, if you wanted to try out new products or work with them to, say, talk about what you liked about the menu doing some of the observational analysis on your customer who is there when you've got the time to do the market research and listen to the customer. The flexible ca uh, capacity, I talked about that, the real-time retrofit, the ability to add or remove tables, chairs, seating. I know that US airlines have an amazing capacity to retrofit their aircraft because I have known friends who have booked tickets of uh, being the last seat on the flight to get on the plane to find that they are five to ten rows up because when they booked the ticket reserved the seat they were the last seat on the plane but they've managed to chuck several more rows by shuffling the seats forward don't fly united they are cattle class and they're very good at maximizing the number of humans they can put in a single space it's just not very pleasant to be one of those humans. So we've talked about capacity management. Let's talk about demand. As with the last chapter in pricing, there was a set of questions. And one of the things about this protocol of presenting you with questions is instead of presenting you with things you need to do, these are questions you need to ask so you can think, how am I going to create a solution to my particular business problem. Again, inconsistency means that customization is our friend. So we look at demand patterns and say, well, why is there a demand? Are there peaks? Are, is it trackable and mappable? Do we know and do we have predictions? Are we in an industry that's been mapped already? What knowledge already exists? So this is where we think about our marketing planning our market research, our external environment, and our internal environment. 
what do we already know? How well can we predict based on past patterns? What are the causes to these cyclical variations? What happens here? How do we work with those if they're predictable? How do we start trying to make them more predictable? If there are random, dem random demand changes, how do we build for flexibility or do we accept loss? Do we go, okay, all right, couldn't see it, couldn't call it, just take the hit, move on. Can we also break up how the demand works and see whether in fact there is something we can do in terms of its demand by market rather than demand overall? And one of the best case examples of this was the uh, food court. It was a suburban shopping center. There was a food court that had peak demand periods. And one of those peak demand periods was approximately 3.30 in the afternoon when the high school students arrived en masse to buy something to hang out, sometimes do homework, mostly to chat, but to buy food before they caught their buses home. So there was a public transport hub at one end of the complex, there was a food court at the other end. It was a predictable, obvious and notable spike in demand every day during school semester time that could be budgeted for, capacity could be established. As it happened, the food court and centre management decided to thwart the constant influx of teenagers spending money, this is an important thing to note, is that they prioritised their other segment which was older, mature, adults. What they found by hard experience was that those older, nicer customers spent less money, stayed longer and were more problem than the transitory half hour coming at 3.30, catching a bus at 4, got up to 3 to $5 to spend, but there's 500 of them, versus has $10 to spend and there's 50 of them. So again, the demand, they had, could make more money in a short burst by servicing one particular high demand, high turnover audience than they could over the length of a day against lower demand. So knowing your demand patterns and building your products to suit. And segmenting your audience. So this is where we bring in the segmentation. Demand by period, by time of day, by day of week, by season of year, creates time segments. So temporal segmentation is important. Temporal segmentation gives you a basis upon which to perform market segmentation to then look for people who are available at this time, what is their willingness to pay? For the people who have the willingness to pay, what are the features of this market that I need to know? So if I target them, I can communicate to them effectively. And I can offer them a product they want effectively. All right, to move into the demand management, there's a couple of facets here we want to think about is that we talk about this and there's a couple of good diagrams in the book for this. What we're trying to do ultimately in services marketing is smooth the demand curve. Because our supply is effectively linear, because we can't stockpile excessive supply, we need to ensure that we smooth out demand so that we don't have excess capacity and that we don't have excess demand. Now it's possible to have demand that is within capacity to deliver but outside optimum capacity. That is an area that needs smoothing. Yes you are succeeding, you're doing well, but your service quality is less than expected, it's more crowded than expected, so you're going to lose some of those customers and you won't be able to maintain that non-optimum excess capacity. So you want to, again, you're looking here for a set of options and strategies. One of the things with the excessive capacity that you really want to be careful to 
address, tailor or target, is that an empty restaurant is a quality signal. An empty service says, doesn't necessarily say to the customer, oh, I should go there, there's plenty of, yeah. You walk past the restaurant, wow, empty. Hmm. Definitely should go in there, gonna have the place to myself. Quite often in service perception, because it's an intangible, credence, search, and experience, the search is, are there other people like me using this product? The word of mouth and word of presence. You look across and go, right, there are people like me in this service. I should, this is service, could be for me. You walk past someone that's empty, you can't judge if the service is for you, but you can judge that nobody else thought it was worth using. So, hey, who wants to disagree with the crowd? You also, on excess capacity, might run into problems of audience, um, where there's co-production required and there's co-audience required. For those of you who are video game players, there's nothing worse than sitting on a server where you are one of 16 players. Because even if you get a second player, you need 14 more people for this to become fun. So where you're looking at things like team events, audience co-production is important, where you need other people to make the environment atmospheric, and lectures top that list. If you are in a, a theatre that has the capacity for 300 students, in a class that's got an enrolment of 300 students, and there are six of you, it is one of the most miserable experiences you will ever have because the air conditioning will be assuming that 300 people's worth of body heat are in the room. And there's just not enough audience to make the service experience work. So demand management is really important on that facet. So let's talk about strategies. Let's talk about how we're going to do this. Uh, we have basically a series of, again, flowchart ideas. What I'd like you to do with table 7.2 is I'd like you to think about how you would draw this back to something like service blueprinting and how you would draw this back to distribution and to price. So in terms of demand management, what can you do in terms of there's excess or insufficient capacity? You can leave it and just see how things go. You can work to it to say, okay, we'll lower demand or we'll increase demand. We'll set up inventory systems, we'll set up queuing systems. So there are frameworks in play. Now, again, with a framework like this, what you are wanting to do as an individual is read through this, but then look for it in operation, look for it in practice. Not just apply it in your case studies, but apply it in life. Whilst you're out, walk past a crowded restaurant. How are they handling queuing? Walk, go through a crowded food court. How are they handling the inventory management? How are they handling order management? Go to the one of the late night McDonald's, see how they handle queuing behavior, how they handle orders, behind the scenes processing, where there's going to be a lag between placing the order and receiving the order. Look at how these things are done and look at what think well, what strategies in play here. How's it working? The other element I wanted to draw your attention to is I do want to draw your attention now to the other elements of the marketing mix. So in terms of demand shaping, product strategy, modified products time-based availability. Not just time-based because breakfast stops being served at 10, but also peak demand. Smaller units that are quicker to produce, but also if you've got, say, a peak hour demand, a lot of people are getting onto a train, you can serve them something that's quicker to consume, a smaller unit that's faster to produce, faster to, faster to consume, they can consume that in their waiting period, their downtime period, whilst they're waiting for another service. Pricing strategies to offer peak premium prices, price shifting to move demand to pick up troughs, uh, move peaks to troughs. Again, what you're thinking about here is how do we combine these ideas? How do I go and take product, a price and distribution and use it to shape demand to get the type of customer I want 
at the time I want them. So the last aspect I want to draw your attention to is I want to talk to you about the psychology of waiting. And this is important because the psychology of waiting has a series of facets here that are product opportunities. So first up on the list is that unoccupied time feels longer than occupied time. If people are doing something, they feel that something is, they don't feel the passage of time. Particularly if you've got a choice between having someone stare at a clock and watch the second hands move, or having them do anything but look at that clock, the time will feel much faster when they're doing something. So we also have things like unfamiliarity and unfair. If you can communicate to someone an expected time frame, a certainty, a level of certainty to it, so they know, okay, you'll be about 15, 20 minutes. If it's going to be uncertain, communicate the uncertainty itself. Look, we're not sure how long it's going to take. So to compensate you for that, for that uncertainty, here we will use a queuing device. We'll have a recall, one of those buzzers, so that you can now make the choice. I will elect to stay, I have something I can do here, or I will move out of the service and occupy my time, particularly doctor surgery at a uh, retail outlet. So you put your doctor surgery into a shopping center, give your customer a pager that will work throughout the shopping center so they can go off and go shopping whilst waiting. Particularly also if there's two if someone's brought a patient along and not going to be accompanying the patient into the room, that person can get summoned back so that their waiting downtime is not actually, they're not bored, they're not taking up physical space in your environment, you're using the whole of the complex as a service scape. So what you also want to do with the psychology of waiting is say, well, what other products can we sell? Take, for example, you've gone out to, you know, We'll take the A-game players in this. It's Disneyland. You're going to be stuck in a queue. But if the Disneyland application on the iPhone, on the smartphone, has the capacity to trigger events based on where you are in the queue, but trivia questions, get you to undertake small activities, maybe have your line snake past. And it's going to be two hours in this line or and it's like, that's a long time. But on the way through, that line happens to conveniently go past somewhere that's selling food, somewhere that has chairs, somewhere that has a couple of video screens showing people, you know, videos of what to expect when they get inside. Occupied time also can be used to sell other products. So really examine, and this is the service blueprint in coming to its own. How can we make the best use of the fact we've got customers here for this period of time, what can we do with that waiting period as part of a delivered part of a service blueprint design? All right. There are more slides than were covered in the video. There's more stuff in the chapter. It's one of those ones that's important to read over. Basically, as with this one, take your notes. Try not to lose your notes. At this point, we are now several chapters in. In fact, we're half a book in. We're seven chapters in. So I'm going to ask you, if you haven't already, set up your off-site backup, Dropbox or uh, Google Drive, Microsoft Office backup. Make certain your notes are secured, supported. You've got backup copies of your material. Your readings are kept off-site somewhere. Just take this chapter, take the, your activity outside this chapter, is to ensure you've got your backup plan in place. And that, include, that goes for all of your subjects, not just for me, not just for services. Get your backup plan in place. If there's a catastrophic failure, you leave a bag behind, you lose your notes, the cat gets overexcited with the laptop, whatever happens, you're covered. Make certain your backup's in place. That's your task for this week. As always, if you need me, here's my contact points. Get in touch. Ask a question if you're unsure about anything. Come see me if you need to. 
And that is the final thing I'm going to say is the Meet Me. It's called Schedule Once. If you haven't used it and you haven't looked at it, it is a queuing mechanism. I can allocate 15 minute spaces to students so that I have a demand management scheme for my consultation time. It is called Schedule Once. It's well worth you having a look at because it's also a means by which I can manage capacity. I can allocate this time so that I know if I don't have a 15 minute window booked, that 15 minutes can be used for something else. So it's really, much, it's really actually integral to the content of the chapter. So give it a look, see. And uh, as always, if you need anything, make the connection.